Hope you guys are doing all right. I'm a little frazzled. I mean, it's been a long night. Um, I'm, I live in Bonn and I came up to here uh, to Hamburg to give this talk. Um, and I was out um, in town. So I, I first want to tell you a story about what I experienced. Um, basically, I was in the, uh, let's see if this can move, if this works. No. Can you click, click you with the mouse? Click those, yeah. yeah, okay. Now it should work. Yeah. And um, I was in the uh, Karolinenviertel, and um, I looked up in the sky, and I saw all these lights, and I was like, what the heck is going on here? And I was um, kind of scared, because I never really see anything like that in Bonn. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the lights kind of got brighter and brighter, and I heard this, like, buzzing sound, um, so it kind of freaked me out. Didn't think much about it um, until um, this morning. And I was on my way to the office and I saw this bright light again. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Um, and so I walked towards it, you know, took this picture. And then I heard this sound again. I was like, I didn't know what it was. And then all of a sudden I saw this huge thing in the sky and it freaked me out. So I, I ran backwards, I flipped over a bike, and then ended up hitting my head on, um, on a car. So that's why you know, I have the bandage here. And um, basically, it made me feel like uh, this guy. And yeah, it made me think, man, I wish I had a stunt double. Because basically, you know, in this movie, the actor, the main actor, he, he doesn't do all the stunts. He has a stunt double that looks like him and uh, basically does all the crazy stuff so the actor doesn't get hurt. Um, I think that's Eric's brother on the right. I'm not sure. Looks could, could be, but um, yeah. So basically, yeah, you need um, a stunt double, and of course, I'm not going to talk about stunt doubles. Um, you know, this is just um, for fun. I'm talking about <laughs> flash of unstyled text, and uh, this is something that we see on websites everywhere. And I'll show a couple examples. It's basically whenever you have a fallback font and a brand font. So the brand font loads, and then uh, we just see this kind of flicker, the layout shifts due to a mismatch be between these two fonts. And so basically, um, yeah, we see, you probably saw that on this website when you uh, went to the meetup page. Um, basically the headline text um, loading, you know, it takes a while and then it changes. You see it also on websites that we know and trust. We see it on other websites we know and trust. And, um, you know, this is actually, you know, it's, it's just a little small thing. Of course, this is, you know, on a 3G fast connection. So, um, you know, if you're in the office, you're not likely to see it, or it's maybe just a, you know, a millisecond or, or, or few of, um, you know, this, Fout this flash of unstyled text. Um, so I had a look at some of the top websites in Germany, uh, according to some similar web. And um, yeah, we see it on tagesschau.de. You know, you start reading the article, and, and this is something that real uh, users experience. You know, I was on the, the train up here and, um, you know, trying to surf the internet and look at different web pages. And then this is something that happens. You know, you start reading the text, and then, oh, shoot. What's happened? And uh, yeah, we see it on one of Germany's most beloved um, newspapers. <laughs> and we see it on chip.de. It's not so bad in this case. It's just a little minor shift there. And we uh, see some shifty characters on this page. It's a very shifty characters there. And uh, we also see it here on Welt, 
.de. It's not so bad, not so um, prominent in this case. Um, here on twitch.tv, a very popular website here in Germany, we don't see any layout shift whatsoever. Of course, the pictures are taking forever to load. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a quick look and they do actually declare or they, they have that in the um, font family. They say they want to use the Rob, Robert and Inter, but they um, basically don't end up loading this font. So um, they just forget to, to download it. And uh, of course they have basically no problems uh, due to cumulative layout shift, CLS, um, but if they, if they have, yeah, many problems with uh, LCP, largest contemporary paint. And uh, we don't see any layout shift whatsoever on Der Spiegel. And how could that be? It's because they preload the fonts there. And here in this example, they um, also pre-connect uh, or preload uh, fonts that are on a separate domain, so from the, their CDN. Um, on ecosia.org, we also see quite a lot of layout shift. It's really sad to see. It's an awesome uh, site, really cool. I, I don't know if you've ever tried it. They plant a tree for every time you search um, or every 10 searches or whatever. Um, they also preload fonts here in this case. And the tragic thing is they just fail to preload the headline font. So they preload three um, similar fonts for the body text, but not for the headline. And um, so how does font loading affect FCP, LCP when, um, you know, for example, you're preloading these fonts, you know, you want to request them, you want to get them in there as soon as possible. Um, well, let's take a step back. You know, often in web performance, we talk about the critical rendering path you know, a page loading, what are the critical assets or resources that have to load. Um, we can talk about the critical rendering path to style text. So what happens from the moment you load a web page to um, the styled text? So I go to a web page, get the HTML, maybe the HTML uh, links to a style sheet or has inline CSS. And then here in the CSS, I say, okay, font face, I, uh, please get me foobar waf2 um, and we'll style er every h1 element with that foobar uh, font. And the inter inter interesting thing is um, the preload scanner will not um, request that font until the CSS om is complete. So when the um, CSS object model has been completed and then the layout uh, process kicks off and then we see, okay, we have an H1 on the page. Now give me that font. So um, yeah, then we request the font. Uh, we could also do things like font swap that also has an impact on font loading. Um, and I was kind of unsure about that again, so I had to take a look. Uh, so a quick uh, excursion into the topic of the font display timeline. Um, and this was interesting to read, um, had a look at the MDN um, documentation. And so there are basically three um, phases when it comes to loading and displaying fonts. You have the block phase, so the user agent uh, tries to use a downloaded um, font face and it renders invisible fallback font text in the layout. That's why you know, a layout, you see sort of a structure on the page, even if you might not see um, text immediately. Um, and then there's a swap phase where um, basically the downloaded font face will be swapped in for this um, invisible fallback. And if that fails, then the fallback is used. And so um, there are different, uh, yeah, uh, CSS uh, rules we could use. We could uh, say font display auto, um, and that kind of depends on the user agent. So some user agents might be a bit, have more um, longer block times. Some might have longer swap times and so forth. So that's auto. Or if I just leave out this declaration in font face, then um, it's the same thing basically. I could also do font display block. And um, what that does is the uh, user agent attempts to use a given downloaded font face 
Um, and we have an infinite swap phase. So a lot of time there, in, you know, so it could uh, take a long, long time before the font is downloaded, but when it does get there, then it does switch over. We have font display swap. Um, so a very short block period and then an infinite swap period. We have font display fallback. So a very short block period, a short swap period. And we have font display optional with a very short block period and no swap uh, period. So that's um, you know, one way to load these fonts in there. And we talked about preloading fonts. So basically what that does is in my markup, I have the links to preload these fonts. Um, and so I'm shortening my critical rendering path to style text in this case. And uh, so if that, so the question was, does that have an impact on first contentful paint, largest contentful paint? Well, that depends. Uh, in the case of auto.de, uh, we see the little red bits in this waterfall um, diagram. This is based on connections. We see um, just a little bit of red here. Those are the fonts loading up there. Um, and with Ecosia, okay, they load a lot less, a lot fewer bytes, but um, we see there's a lot more network uh, contention here in this case. So a lot more red going on here. Um, we unfortunately still see the problem with layout shift, but it's also due to the um, erroneous um, font preload there. And this is also actually the, the main question of this talk. Um, what about FAUT and um, CLS? So the flash of unstyled text causes the layout shift. Can we quantify that? How big is this problem? So I um, just did, did a little uh, prototype here. So we have the fallback font, the um, Times New Roman, I think. And then we have this brand font, this fat looking font. Um, so interestingly, if I um, just do this, I just have the headline font in here and it's loading, um, I get zero CLS. And this was for me kind of a shocker. Um, so, you know, I wrote to Barry Pollard um, on, uh, on Slack and I said, hey, uh, I think I broke CLS. He was like, show me your markup. And, you know, and he said, oh yeah, well, basically you need other elements below that to cause the layout shift. So I added some more layouts. And um, here in this case, we do see a CLS of 0, 0, 0, 0.0059 and so forth. If I add more or a larger text block below that, then I get a bit uh, more CLS, a larger CLS. And um, if I add a lot of uh, blocks of text below that or other elements, um, and it's basically filling up the whole viewport, then of course I'm getting into, yeah, it's still in the green with 0 0.08 CLS. But now that I'm completely filling the viewport with um, text and all this, these elements are being shifted, then I'm, you know, starting to get into the, to the yellow there. So, um, yeah, basically we see also when we look at HTTP archive data, we see, um, yeah, good cumulative layout shift, or if you want to inverse it, um, actually pretty not so bad scores, um, you know, across the board. Um, but the problem is we can't really link that to um, this FAUT um, problem that we're seeing. Um, of course, we could try to capture the attribution of um, layout shift using, for example, the Web Vitals attribution build. Um, and we can see, for example, uh, in here, we have the uh, layout shift source and we, we see the la largest, uh, largest shift target is the HTML body, uh, the paragraph basically is what we have here. And um, so interestingly, I'm not seeing anything, any relationship to the, um, actually the, the source or the cause of the layout shift because the body of par the paragraph itself, it doesn't change in any way. It just changes its position due to a different element. Um, so we're not talking about the difference between the end of the um, headline 
but rather the uh, start of the element um, below that. And so basically it's the elements below that are shifted. Those are the things that are shifting. And um, that's what results in CLS. So um, this was for me um, very interesting to dig into this and see that CLS attribution doesn't point to the shifter elements or the cause of the shift, but rather it points to the shifted elements, the recipients of the shift. And so how much does um, FAUT affect CLS? Um, like I said, it depends. It depends on the viewport. So I'm just changing the viewport there and it resulted in different CLS scores. Um, so the size of the shifted elements, the amount of the shift, also the font differences, you know, um, maybe some fonts cause more shift than others. And uh, could also depend on network and uh, traffic conditions, maybe um, on, um, yeah, on, on some pages or some uh, types of um, sites, you don't really have, um, I don't know what I was going to say with that exactly, so I'll skip that point. And I'll just go to the solution, um, and I'll just call that the easy fix. Um, so what, what can we get out of this talk, basically? Well, um, there's a set of new overrides for the font face, um, and they're available in Chromium, uh, Firefox, Edge, um, but unfortunately not in Safari. Um, and they are size adjust, ascent override, descent override, gap uh, override. Let's have a look at those. So say we have a beautiful font here and um, let's look at what size adjust does. Um, size adjust, if you change that, um, it basically scales the whole font. And if we have a look at um, ascent override, basically we're changing the distance between the baseline of the font and the top of it. And uh, descent override is the baseline to the bottom. And then we have gap override, so the space above and below the text, basically. And um, this is important because, I mean, if you want to pick out a brand font, you know, you might go to Google Fonts. And just to scrolling down the page, you just see the difference between the fonts. You know, some, you know, I, I still have the same text in there but some are, you know, multiple lines, four or five lines, some are only three. Um, so we just have a big difference um, here uh, between fonts. So I have this brand font, say, um, uh, da what is it, Dancing Script. And um, I have a system fallback font. And, you know, Mac, for example, it's Times. Um, you know, Windows uses something else. Uh, Linux uses something else, too. Um, and so if I see the fallback font and then the brand font, you know, it, it leads to this uh, flash of unstyled text and this layout shift. And um, so what, what I'm doing, if, for example, if I'm just going to load the brand font on its own, um, dancing script, um, and I say, okay, um, apply that to all headings, um, I could specify fallback fonts, for example for certain um, operating systems. Um, I could say on Mac, for example, brush script MT, that would be a good fallback for um, you know, a, a script a brand font. Uh, or I could use Times New Roman or a serif font. Um, and the main takeaway for this talk and, and the, the quick fix, so to speak, is to uh, declare a custom fallback font. So you um, have an additional font face declaration. You say, okay, I want the font family to be called adjusted times new Roman fallback. I set the source to a local and I can adjust the size adjust, ascent override, descent override, line gap override. And um, here's the important part down here. So. Um, I apply this to the, oh, I can't um, show my cursor, but I'm applying dancing script as the brand font and the fallbacks are the adjusted uh, Times New Roman. I could also declare additional. So basically um, the browser, if I'm using font display swap in this case, for example, also, um, it's gonna display the adjusted Times New Roman fallback until the font uh, dancing script has loaded and it's swapped in. And so um, basically it looks like this. 
so a lot less layout shift in this case. A comparison on the right we have with the custom fallback on the left is without and we can notice quite a big difference in this case. And um, so like I said, you know, it is helpful to look into okay, what are system fonts and um, you know, CSS font stack, there are so many sites out there. Um, and the tough thing is there are no, um, I, I think Arial is probably the most um, widely supported system font um, across browser or across operating systems. So that's usually a good safe bet, but still it um, makes sense to declare multiple um, system fonts as fallbacks. And so what are some tools to do this and to tweak these uh, font face descriptors? Um, well, I built a little tool um, called, uh, yeah, it's a font fallback font generator. Basically what you do is you just um, drag and drop a brand font in there and then you just tweak the descriptors there. Um, and it's a lot of fun because then you kind of see the relationship between these different um, yeah, parameters and you can copy the CSS and paste it into your own code. But why do it manually when you can do it automated? Um, there are tools out there, CapSize or a FontPy, um, where you can um, basically include those in your, in your code and they'll automatically um, give you the fallbacks for whatever uh, brand fonts you throw in there. Um, and I think Next and Nuxt are also have um, options available um, soon. So what does this get us in the end if we use these custom fallback fonts? Um, so with my little prototype here, this was before. And we see there was quite a lot of layout shift um, due to that. And after, we see the zero layout shift. So that's a, a quick win um, for very um, you know, minimal code. And it's very non-obtrusive there. So um, a pretty good way to go. And it, I mean, Safari is just gonna ignore it, doesn't understand it anyway. So pretty good, quick win. With AutoDE, um, so we talked about the font preloads. And um, the thing is, yeah, uh, First of all, I, I wonder why they even um, preload the headline font when it's not really any different, um, yeah, to the fallbacks. But let's have a look at, um, yeah, whether we should preload these fonts or not. That's the question. So I just ran a quick test, um, also using web page test. Um, I removed the font preloads using um, experiments. And um, so on the left-hand side, we see the experiment. On the right-hand side is the original. And so we see the experiment, so the, without the font preloads in 3G fast conditions, um, it's quicker out the door. It's um, rendered quicker than the original. So that's um, important to keep in mind. You know, um, also like, for example, have a look at your um, traffic. Um, do you have a lot of uh, slower traffic on your site, so maybe a lot more mobile uh, traffic to certain pages Ki might kind of depend on the page type. And um, yeah, so what did the results look like in this case? Well, we do see um, faster um, first contentful paint, largest contentful paint, better layout uh, shift or, or lower layout shift. Um, by re removing the font preloads under these test conditions. And um, we see the difference in the uh, film strip there. And um, looking at the original, so with the, with the font preloads, they're um, loaded really high up in the uh, waterfall, so um, very high priority in this case. Um, with the experiment removing that, we see that the fonts are loaded way at the end. So way down here. Yeah, and with Ecosia, so we had the, um, also the font preloads, um, had a closer look at that, ran a couple different tests. So original with the uh, three preloads in there, a second test with um, adding just font display swap because they didn't have that in there. Third test with um, preloading the headline font as well. 
fourth, no font preloads and adding the fallback. So um, basically the, the um, quick fix solution that I was talking about. And then fifth, no font preloads, no fallback or anything. And what we see is, so definitely four and five. So without the font preloads um, are quickest to render. And so now we kind of get into gray, a gray area. Does it make sense to preload the fonts? Yes or no? You know, under these test conditions, um, I, I personally think, uh, you know, using the custom fallback is nice. I think it's, um, I mean, we don't have layout shift. Of course, it does look a little off when the brand font does load. Um, it's certainly nicer than not having any custom fallback font in, in case uh, in test number five. Um, yeah, so just some food for thought, thought there. And uh, yeah, so basically what we see here happening is, yeah, like I said, the um, headline font loading way too late. Um, you know, they could also do that. They could um, try and preload that headline font, use a um, custom fallback but they also should reduce the size of these um, three other fonts that they have here. I mean, that's uh, quite a bit of data just for three very similar, similar font faces. And um, for example, the interbold, um, you know, they're supporting so many different languages, um, you know, so many glyphs in there. And it's also the question about um, localization. Do you need all these different um, variants um, for all, every country um, or not. So if you're going to preload, preload with care. Um, and so you wanna think about maybe subsetting fonts, um, making sure you have the right paths. So if, um, and I've experienced this also um, in, in the wild, you know, um, you preload fonts um, and you might have a hash in the uh, URL in the path and um, you know, after a new update, you, you know, de uh, deploy something new and then the paths change, but maybe on some pages they're old and so you get duplicate font downloads and it's all messy. Um, might wanna think about only doing font preloads for certain page types. So maybe on certain pages, you don't have a lot of text way uh, or in the initial viewport. So maybe it's not an issue. So maybe you don't even need the font preloads in this case and think about traffic and network conditions. So, um, you know, if you have a lot of users on slower devices, um, then just maybe you don't wanna preload fonts in that case. And so just um, kind of wrapping it up with uh, some of the comparisons from uh, Ecosia and we see, um, yeah, so better first contentful paint for um, without the preloads and we see um, largest contentful paint improvements also without font preloads, um, better or less layout shift without preloads. So, um, and also, yeah, the takeaway is if you're gonna use brand fonts, have a good fallback. Yeah, so that was a lot of stuff very late in the evening. Um, just to summarize uh, quickly, first of all, check how your fallback or, or how your fonts uh, match up with your um, brand fonts on your site. So do you see any layout shift there? Just um, have an eye, keep an eye on that. And, and once you see these problems, you can't really unsee them. So um, kind of highlighted this problem and you'll probably always see it now. Um, ask yourself, do I really need a web font? Like in the case of um, auto.de, I think there was hardly any difference between the fallback and the um, brand font. So why even have the brand font in that case? Um, number three, use system fonts as fallbacks um, and tweak the font face descriptors, um, like I said, for Chromium, uh, Firefox, and Edge. Uh, five, look at analytics and RUM and ask, um, yeah, do I really need the preloads? Uh, six, and if you're preloading the fonts, only preload what you need. So subset your fonts um, and use, um, yeah, and the font faces. And one final tip. Very important, especially if you're going into Carolina and Fiat, um, you want to make sure you have a stunt double with you <laughs> when they come. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so any questions there?
try to do my best to answer. Yeah. Um, so you have shown the, the mobile view where you have implemented the fallback pond. And what we have still seen is that the, the text in the um, horizontal direction is still uh, shifting. And if you, for example, have a spe special report size, then maybe you get an additional line through the, uh, the swapping. Is there any solution to also define the width basically of the letters? Like no, unfortunately not. Um, that's why it's good to try different um, fallback fonts. Oh, the, the question was, um, you do you also see some change between, um, you know, in the horizontal direction um, between fallbacks and brand fonts. Um, yeah, got to try out different fallback fonts. And um, I mean, one thing that doesn't work is using um, letter spacing, for example, because um, it just doesn't work in that case. If you apply letter spacing to um, all paragraphs or all H1 elements, then it's applied also to the fallback. So it's just going to change everything in that case. Yeah. Tricky thing to do. Yeah. I found really interesting that CLS doesn't account for the element itself shifting. Do you happen to know if they plan to change that. I know that they are discussing potential different definitions of CLS and how it might be more fair. Do you think that could be one part that will be included in the future? Yeah, a uh, good question. So the question was um, whether or not um, CLS attribution should be changed or will be changed to account for the actual source or the cause or the cause of um, layout shift. Um, I don't know. Um, I think that's something it's, that's definitely worth discussing with um, yeah, the Chrome team, for example. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's an um, interesting question because, I mean, it would be really awesome to be able to, for example, with RUM tooling, see okay what actually caused um all that layout shift because actually that's what you want to fix the the cause of the layout shift not what's actually shifted in the end yeah yeah it's not a question but <clears throat> I, I think the problem uh, they want to fix is uh if you read uh, a, a web page and uh, uh before the element you are uh, reading there is uh, for example a slider with different uh, heights and uh, the, the slide uh, is changing and it is shifting your content, uh, but you're reading below. So uh, your content is moving. And that is the user experience fail they want to, uh, to, to, to solve um, in this case. Yeah. So that's why they are looking at uh, the shifted elements and not the shifter. Yeah. Yeah, good um, comment regarding, um, you know, attribution or the, actually the, the whole uh, point of CLS is to, um, yeah, improve the user experience. And so it's taking a look at, okay, what's moving around on the page? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it might not always be another element causing a shift. It could also be some JavaScript kicking and setting the class or whatever you're reading on. So yeah. it doesn't always need to be an element above that move something out. Yeah. But I had one question um, regarding the font size adjust. I saw already when you define a custom default and when you define a fallback font. If you have, for whatever reason, different fallback fonts on, let's say, Mac OS and Windows or whatever, do you know if there's any way to define different adjustments for those different fallback fonts? I don't think there is. Uh Yes, uh, you can. Let me see if I can. Uh, well, the question was, um, can you change the font face descriptors for different fallback fonts? So basically having a look at this slide here. Um, yeah, so basically if um, I declare, a, I create a font family um, that is based upon Times New Roman, I call it adjusted Times New Roman, I could call it whatever. So basically I would, um, I would declare multiple font faces, uh, yeah. descriptors, and then that would work out. Yeah. Realizing at the moment of why we just wrote that slide again. Yeah. No worries. No worries. <laughs> yeah. One more you know, there's a built in way to not show anything at all until you have the real font, or is that usually a stupid idea? Uh, let's see. 
So the question is whether you could hide the text until the um, brand font is displayed. Um, and th this is where I always get confused. I don't know if it's um, by saying font block, font display block. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Or optional, I think. And, and I think optional would also be a way. Um, so basically, if the, the font gets there, um, then it's, it's loaded. But if it doesn't get there, then it won't be displayed. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not quite exactly that solution to just hide it until it's there. You know? Yeah. What some people tend to do, which I don't say it's, it's a good idea, but they hide the body and then in the un unload handle of the font, they, they just show the body. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't do that, but yeah. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Yeah, great. Yeah, um, awesome. Yeah, one more okay. question? One more. Yeah, not yeah. really a question. Okay. Really great talk, and I'm not sure if I haven't seen slides that great, at least <laughs> not in a long time. So you definitely have to show me how you did that. Ah. That was so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, cool.